You hear me, guys? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the first of our fluid seminars this year. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, Christopher Douglas. Uh, who is a postdoc researcher now under the Ma Marie Curie uh, grant at um, uh, LADIX, uh, working with uh, Lutz uh, Leschaft and um, also partly with uh, Wolfgang Porlifke in uh, TU München, uh, working on instability resolving analysis of uh, jet flames. Uh, Chris got his PhD in 2021 uh, from Georgia Tech, working with Tim Lewin. Uh, and today, he's going to talk about dynamics and bifurcations of uh, swirling jets. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, I'm Chris. Nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. Uh, before I get started, uh, she already mentioned these names, but I'd like to just quickly thank uh, Lutz, Tim, and Ben uh, for their help. These are our co-authors and everything I'm going to talk about today. Um, and then many others who I don't have time to go into detail thanking. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of people behind this work. So what's a swirling jet? Um, I'm not sure what everyone's familiarity is with swirling jets, but swirling jets are really interesting and canonical fluid flows that have a range of really complicated um, and in intricate features. Um, the main uh, feature of a jet, of course, is that it has sort of a concentration of momentum uh, oriented in one particular direction. Uh, but swirling jets also have a uh, swirl, and so they, while they're propagating in one uh, direction, they're also um, rotating around a central axis, and that leads to a bunch of really interesting flow features, uh, which I'll go into in this talk. And swirling flows are ubiquitous in all sorts of uh, natural applications and engineering applications. Um, we can think of things like tornadoes in weather, and also quasars in, uh, in astrophysics, which are both, uh, experience are, are both manifestations of swirling jets in real flows. Uh, in hemodynamics, uh, uh, the flow around um, out of your heart um, there are certain uh, pathological conditions that are associated with excess swirl, uh, which can lead to a lot of the instabilities and sort of things that we'll be talking about in this, in this talk. And then, uh, of course, in engineering systems, swirling jets are really common. Whether it's in uh, something like an aviation flow, where this is the flow over a uh, delta wing at high angle of attack, uh, you can see that this uh, induces this uh, vorticity, which uh, trails down uh, and intensifies until these different instabilities happen. Um, it can be used for flow separation and things like uh, Dyson vacuum cleaners or uh, larger industrial flow separators. Um, but the main thing I want to focus on in this talk, uh, the main application I'm interested in, or I was interested in when I was uh, when doing my PhD, um, is power and propulsion, uh, where swirling jets are used for a few key reasons. Um, basically, swirl uh, enhances mixing and entrainment. And so basically, if you have a really long jet flame, if you add a bunch of swirl, you can compactify that flame, which is really great if you're trying to fit it into an engineering system. And also promotes flame stability. Uh, you can see in this uh, this visualization basically that the flame uh, is sort of uh, stabilized. Uh, it very quickly spreads um, and nicely mixes, um, and that that helps the stability of the system generally. Um, swirling jets are also really interesting, uh, not just for applications, but uh, in terms of the underlying physics to study as a scientist. Um, and that's because they've got a lot of distinct instability mechanisms. Um, and so I'll just go through. The the three big ones here, um, but these all are sort of separate. We can picture them in separate ways, but in swirling jets, they really interact, um, and they're they're not uh, exactly separable. But, anyways, uh, the the most basic one I think uh, is centrifugation, um, where you can think of a canonical example of that being in uh, in the flow in a Taylor Coet flow, uh, where you just have rotating cylinders, um, and you see these uh, centrifugal instabilities that are induced, which manifest as Taylor rolls in that system. Um, you can also have you also have velocity shear associated with the uh, shear layers in swirling jets, um, and these lead to uh, shear layer roll up, Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities, both in the axial direction. This is a non-swirling jet, but you can see this nice, um, this uh, these nice Kelvin Helmholtz rolls, but also in the azimuthal direction uh, due to this azimuthal motion. Uh, so there's both axial and azimuthal shear, and also I think the least intuitive uh, fundamental thing here is the Coriolis force, which happens. Um, anytime you're in a rotating system where you have radial and azimuthal motion, basically there's an inherent coupling due to the Coriolis force between radial and azimuthal uh, motion. Um, and the canonical example of that is the Rossby wave. If you've ever heard of the polar vortex or something like that in the winter, um, that's, that can be attributed to uh, the Rossby wave, um, which is an inertial wave that stems from the Coriolis force. And so here's the quick outline of the talk. I just gave, went through a quick uh, sort of background and motivation. 
um, and here's what uh, here's what we'll be talking about. Um, so to get a little bit more concrete with uh, some of the physics of rolling jets, uh, I think there's a really great uh, experiment that was done with a lot of great flow visualization uh, from Ling and Maxworthy, uh, where they worked with a system that's arranged like this. So we have a laminar flow, uh, which is coming through a pipe uh, that is in rotation, and uh, comes through a honeycomb, um, and passes out of a nozzle into a tank where they have a bunch of uh, diagnostics equipment set up. Um, so basically, we have a flow which is in uh, solid body rotation uh, with a near top hat profile, which uh, comes into a test tank, um, and we can study the evolution of this system. The real nice thing about this is that, that since there's a motor controlling the swirl, you can very independently control the Reynolds number and the swirl number, which is sort of the two key parameters to understand uh, swirling flows. So S equals zero, which is uh, no rotation. We have just an axisymmetric jet. And so in this case, uh, we get exactly what you expect in, the swirl in, a, in an axisymmetric jet. Uh, we just have sort of a laminar region which grows, uh, where instabilities grow, uh, until we get you know, nice axisymmetric vortex rings. Um, which eventually cascade down into turbulence uh, as, the, as the system evolves spatially. As we start to add swirl, these dynamics are modified. We can already see at relatively low swirl, I'm not going to get too quantitative here, I just want to give you a qualitative understanding here. At low swirl, we can start to see that these uh, initially axisymmetric vortex rings are now starting to get tilted. And as we increase swirl further, uh, this becomes even more extreme until it's actually quite difficult to pick out what exactly is a Kelvin Helmholtz uh, ring and what's something else. Um, and so basically as we increase swirl, the system, we see a clear break in axisymmetry of the system. The system breaks symmetry as we in increase swirl. And then at high S we have this phenomenon called vortex breakdown, uh, which is something I'll go into later as well. Uh, where basically now uh, we still have these uh, shear layer dynamics, but now we also have this uh, fully turbulent region, which is actually a recirculation zone, uh, uh, a central recirculation zone, which is caused by uh, basically internal flow forces. There's no uh, bluff body here, but it almost looks like a bluff body wake is there. Um, and this is this is something which makes swirling flows really interesting um, and really desirable for applications like uh, combustors because uh, we have this no velocity uh, stream surface here, which can be used to stabilize the flame. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about vortex breakdown. Um, vortex breakdown is kind of a confusing thing in the literature if you just jump into it uh, from, uh, from not having a background because uh, it can be referred to both as a thing, like a, a physical manifestation of something you see, and as a phenomenon. Um, and it's important to just draw a distinction between those two things. Um, so in my talk, I'm going to be referring to it as a phenomenon, and we'll, I'll, I'll describe what I mean in a bit more detail in a little bit. Basically, the most basic way we can think of vortex breakdown is if we think of a flow in a rotating pipe. So we've got an inviscid flow in a rotating pipe here, and we can uh, think about disturbances to this flow uh, of this form. Um, and uh, if you plug this in uh, to the, uh, the um, not the Niver Stokes equations, but the inviscid version, uh, the, um, can't think of the name, but uh, yeah, if you plug these into the, the governing equations, basically you can derive a dispersion relationship which governs um, how waves propagate in this uh, in this system, and it turns out that there are basically two two terms which interact. That you've got a Doppler shift, um, which is associated with how much streamwise flow you have, um, and Kelvin waves, which are associated with the inertial uh, inertial waves. This is associated with the Coriolis force. And so, if we start at a condition with very low swirl, uh, or maybe not very low swirl, but low swirl. Um, we can see a, a diagram of uh, wave number and frequency that looks like this. Basically, we have the contribution from the Doppler shift along this dotted line in the center, and then we have uh, sort of a spreading from that which is caused by these Kelvin waves. And so at a swirl uh, below a critical state, um, you can see that all these waves have a positive slope all the way through the domain. And that means that if we disturb the flow, any, uh, any disturbance will propagate out of the domain. So it can't, uh, it can't back propagate and stabilize inside the flow domain, hence the term supercritical. We also have a critical state at a critical swirl uh, where now we get a slope at of zero at k equals zero. So the basically the, the longest wave, uh, the infinitely long wave, has a zero group velocity and doesn't move. But then as we go to a subcritical state, we have a finite region of uh, zero group velocity. And so we have a, a wave which is now able to propagate in that system, or able to sustain itself in that system. Um, and this induces a, a, a transformation in the, in the flow state. 
And so this is a visualization that was done uh, by Wang and Rusak. These are streamlines, um, basically, and they, they studied uh, that, that same configuration I just showed, uh, where they introduced a perturbation to the initially columnar state and watched as time evolved until it evolved into a breakdown state. And so what you can see here is basically um, as we have, uh, this is at a subcritical uh, swirl value, uh, we introduce a perturbation, and you can see uh, these waves are accumulating uh, near the inlet of the domain, and then uh, the, the flow is kind of continuing outwards until that, um, that's maintained. If we were to spontaneously decrease the swirl below the critical value at this point, um, then the system would sort of go in reverse order here, where we'd see uh, a, a, a transition from the breakdown state back to a, a columnar state. And so um, the, the, this diagram sort of uh, explains what I just said. Um, as we increase uh, rotation, uh, this is called omega here, but this is, this is swirl. As we increase swirl, basically, we reach a critical state where um, infinitesimal disturbances are suddenly able to stabilize in the flow. And that, through nonlinear mechanisms, drives a transition from that columnar state to a breakdown state. What, uh, what is shown in this axis is the minimum of the axial velocity on the center line. Once we're in the breakdown state, there's a different critical point associated with uh, loss of stability of that uh, breakdown state, where the system bifurcates back to a, a columnar solution. And so you can see here there's a finite interval of hysteresis between what the, the point where vortex breakdown spontaneously emerges and the point where it disappears. And so this is uh, um, in interesting because um, it means that there's hysteresis in the system, which is really important to understand if you're designing something like a combustion system, which you want to operate reliably reliably. Um, now I mentioned earlier how there's kind of a distinction between breakdown state and breakdown flow uh, structure. Um, and breakdown state is something that people use to describe the topology, the appearance of a flow. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the flow is taking that appearance because of the vortex breakdown phenomenon. Um, and this is something which is uh, wh which I'll talk about. Uh, some of my results had some implications on this. Um, but these are just visualizations of some different structures of vortex breakdown states. They all have the central recirculation zone, but you can see that the flow structure can be actually quite different even once breakdown occurs. Um, and this is not due to those axisymmetric dynamics of vortex breakdown, but due to other instabilities uh, which come into play. Um, this is a, a plot from a recent uh, paper which shows basically a kind of describes the confusion in the literature uh, associated with um, vortex breakdown and the different topologies uh, that we see. Um, basically, we have uh, at low swirl numbers here, we have sort of the qualitative pre-vortex breakdown dynamics. And you can see there's all sorts of uh, different uh, things that happen as we increase swirl and uh, vortex breakdowns start to occur. Um, VB here just means vortex breakdown. So these are all different types of vortex breakdown that are classified. Um, but the key thing I wanted to say here is that the uh, vortex breakdown phenomenon is only part of what's driving these uh, structural changes in the flow topology. Another really important one is the Kawanda effect, um, which appears in confined systems. And so uh, if we have an unconfined jet, uh, like this one here, we can see that there's a uh, sort of fast flow here, which we know has a low pressure, and uh, ambient fluid, which has a high pressure. And this is kind of drives the entrainment process. But if we introduce a wall on any side of the jet, basically that blocks uh, the, the flow uh, from being freely entrained and uh, decreases the pressure here, which causes a net force on the jet and leads to attachment of jets uh, or any, any flow uh, to a surface um, due to the Cohen effect. And this is really important for swirling jets. You can get drastic changes in flow topology and hysteresis associated not just with this vortex breakdown phenomenon, but also uh, with a Cohen effect. And so this is an experimental diagram done by Ogus et al. where they showed um, how they went from a closed jet uh, at relatively low swirl they had vortex breakdown, then they had attachment of the, of the jet to their uh, sort of their conical uh, injector system, and it, that maintained it itself all the way as they decreased in swirl. So this can be a quite dramatic change in the flow topology. Um, moving on, I'm going to talk about the instabilities which happen in vortex breakdown. Uh, so not just this uh, transition between sort of time average flow states, but also the instantaneous uh, flow structures, or the phase average flow structures, uh, which appear uh, in swirling jets. So this is an example that was done, taken at Letix uh, back in the 90s, which has a really cool picture uh, showing a, a planar cross-section 
um, and an axial cross section of this uh, this instability in the swirling jet. Um, and uh, these instabilities are in an axisymmetric system, uh, th and they're asymmetric, which means they rotate. Um, they don't just uh, they're not just like a Kelvin Helmholtz wave, uh, an axisymmetric Kelvin Helmholtz wave that leads to these nice um, axisymmetric rings. Uh, these can be quite complex, and they can be uh, either co-rotating or counter-rotating. And uh, in there, in this experiment, uh, it was shown that the m equals two instabilities in their swirling jet tended to be co-rotating uh, and have a relatively low frequency, well, whereas the um, the m equals one instabilities were the ones that are singly periodic as you go around the azimuth. <coughs> Excuse me. Those tend to have a higher uh, frequency and to be counter-rotating. Um, and you can see that there's a distinct uh, sort of interval of swirl where each of these appears. Uh, in in these studies, um, basically this uh, this m equals two m equals one transition is pretty repeatable. Um, and one thing that was done by this Ling and Maxworthy uh, paper, which I talked about earlier, is they sort of classified uh, the amplitudes of these based on this power spectral density, and were able to conclude that um, there was an m equals one and m equals two instability, which were both uh, supercritical bifurcations. Um, However, uh, so we are going to look at some results which uh, suggest that that's not always the case. And with that, uh, I'm going to move on to the methodology that I'm going to use uh, to, to pursue the questions of my talk. Um, to study this system, excuse me, <coughs> um, we're going to be using a, a, a model uh, swirling jet, which looks like this. Basically, it's very similar to that Liang and Maxworthy system. We have a rotating pipe and a static uh, domain. We can control the confinement, basically the uh, the ratio of the the outer uh, the container wall to the the pipe. I'm sorry, the, the container radius to the pipe radius is C, and then uh, we can also control the separation between sort of the back wall and the the nozzle, which I'll show is actually a, a very important parameter. Um, and then uh, the swirl number uh, controls basically how fast the, the pipe wall is rotating. One difference is that I'm going to be using a parabolic inlet profile rather than a top hat profile. This is just to eliminate uh, any uh, influences from the Reynolds number on the inflow velocity profile. So to study this, uh, we're going to treat this as a dynamical system, uh, which means that we're going to study the dynamics uh, of uh, this, this flow state, uh, which is a coupling of, of U and P and uh, obeys the Navier-Stokes equations, which I'm not going to write out in detail here. But basically, we can identify steady states, uh, which satisfy the steady part of this equation. And I can use the nonlinear um, continuation method uh, to continue this, uh, these solutions along a parameter using uh, something like an arc-like continuation method. Um, and basically, this is important because it allows us to trace solutions even past these bifurcation points. If we were just uh, sort of naively increasing parameter values and solving the nonlinear system, it's very unlikely that we would be able to, to accommodate large changes in the, the flow structure um, for a very nonlinear system. We can also do stability analysis to these steady states um, using eigenvalue analysis. Basically, this this uh, this system, uh, this linearized system, governs the long time evolution of uh, very small perturbations uh, to to this system, and so we will study that um, just by looking at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors associated with uh, any perturbation of this form, which is a completely generic expression for the perturbations in an axisymmetric system. Um, this uh, Im one important note here is that they, these perturbations have a growth rate, which can either be positive or negative, uh, and a frequency associated with the rotation. Um, and so the, if, if the growth rate is positive, that means it's unstable. The growth rate is negative. Um, then we have a stable perturbation. Um, and one important consequence of this is that there are bifurcation points where the uh, where sigma equals zero. Um, so that, that's sort of something that uh, we want to keep track of. And then the last thing which I'll talk about uh, in my analysis is the idea of limit cycle states. Uh, so we're interested not just in uh, sort of the linear point, uh, the point where linear perturbations become unstable, but also how those perturbations evolve into a periodic solution. Um, and one way we can identify periodic states is by doing a uh, harmonic balance expansion, or a, a, which is a spectral representation of a periodic orbit. Basically, we have a, a time average component plus a, a non, a basically the Fourier components associated with that oscillation, where this, uh, this frequency now 
is the actual period of that, that oscillation, and it has harmonics which are associated with n. So n equals 1 is the fundamental, then n equals 2 is the first harmonic, and so on and so forth. And we can do that to whatever order we need to properly resolve the system. And this leads to a fully coupled system of nonlinear equations. Uh, one equation for the mean flow, which includes the Reynolds stress from the oscillations, uh, and equations for the oscillations, uh, which also include um, the Reynolds stresses, and then a phase constraint, which ensures that the system satisfies periodicity, and this, this determines the frequency. So this is a, a very large system, but it's just like what we were using for the, the nonlinear steady states, and so we can use the same nonlinear continuation method um, to continue these along a parameter. Let's move on to the results. Um, so I went through three kind of categories uh, of, of topics in the literature review, and I'm going to go through uh, the same in, the, in these results. Um, so the first is the role of vortex breakdown in the competition between uh, central and wall jet states. So I uh, early on, I was commenting on how this, uh, this hysteresis isn't always caused by vortex breakdown. There's also other effects at play, and so let's study that. To study that, I'm going to start with uh, this system, uh, which has a infinite radial confinement. So basically, uh, I showed, actually, let me go back to the diagram here. Um, I showed this diagram where I said this is, uh, this can be adjusted. So the first case we're going to study is with L equals zero, so sort of a flush injection, and this wall extremely far away. <coughs> um, so this is at a fixed Reynolds number. Uh, I've got the, uh, the minimum of the axial velocity plotted on this axis, uh, the growth rate of the eigenvalues on this axis, and uh, swirl on this axis. And so what we see is that at zero swirl, we have a steady jet. Excuse me again. <coughs> um, yeah, so at zero swirl, we have a, a, a steady jet. As we increase swirl, this jet, uh, the, the minimum axial velocity changes. Um, and then we get to this interesting region here where we can see that the, the minimum axial velocity crosses zero. That's a sign that vortex breakdown occurs. You can show that uh, graphically here. The colors here represent uh, the azimuth azimuthal velocity, and these are streamlines. Uh, the black ones are the separation streamlines. Um, and so basically, we can see that as we increase swirl from one, two, to three, uh, we see an enhanced spreading of the jet, basically an enhanced dissipation uh, and mixing and entrainment. Then when we get to four, we've crossed this uh, this vortex breakdown threshold where now we have a central recirculation bubble which appears in the axis. At point four, there's a critical point. Uh, there's an eigenvalue which crosses the real axis, and we have a saddle node bifurcation where the system curls back, the solution curls back on itself in a fold um, and propagates along this unstable edge. <coughs> um, yeah. So in this, uh, on along this unstable branch, the system dramatically changes its structure. It goes from being uh, sort of a central jet, a columnar type structure, to a wall jet type structure where the, the, um, the jet orients itself outwards and propagates, instead of being, uh, instead of along the center line, reorients itself to be along the wall. And so this is a transition, this, uh, this hysteresis, or this, uh, this nonlinear transition occurs between not just a uh, columnar jet to a breakdown state, but entirely to an entirely different uh, solution, which is associated with the wall jet. Um, and this is important because uh, this this breakdown is not associated with hysteresis in this case. We have a, a smooth transition from a central jet to a, a breakdown state. The hysteresis is associated with a different transition, which is this wall jet. And we can study this in a lot of different systems. So now I'm going to bring in the, those confinement parameters. First, continuing with this axisymmetric, or continuing with this uh, unconfined system, I'm going to look at the effect of the, the inlet, the axial wall. So as we change this, we basically uh, can see a disappearance of the wall jet solution um, as, the, as the wall is removed from the, uh, the system. So basically, as we increase L, this wall is getting further and further away from the outlet of the jet. And we can see that um, at large L, there is no hysteresis. There's no bistable no region. 
And there's also uh, this wall jet solution disappears. We just have a steady central jet with a central recirculation zone. And we can see that uh, in this diagram, at different values of L, where L equals zero is the case we just looked at, where we have a, a clear wall jet region at high swirl. Whereas at something like L equals two, we have uh, that, that doesn't exist. And so we can see um, basically that this by, st by stability is controlled not by uh, swirl really, but rather by the confinement from that wall. The same can be studied if we, instead of using the axial wall, if we look at the role of the radial wall, it turns out that the same dynamics appear. Uh, there's this transition associated with the transition between a central jet and a wall jet. This is not vortex breakdown, but rather a commando effect. Um, and that leads to the first perspective uh, from, my, from this talk which is this, uh, this bifurcation and flow structure associated with a change from a, a sort of a closed bubble type vortex breakdown to a cone type vortex breakdown. It's not really vortex breakdown. And it's kind of, uh, the, the physics controlling this transition are not vortex breakdown, but rather uh, the quant effect and confinement. Basically, if we have a central recirculation zone that dominates, uh, we have a central jet. And if we have an outer recirculation zone that dominates because of the quant effect, we transition to this wall jet. Now I'll move on to the role of nonlinearity um, and look at how this, uh, this symmetry breaking occurs in swirling jets. So this is a bifurcation diagram along two different parameters. Uh, for the same swirling jet I just studied, um, this is the case of uh, flush injection um, and no radial confinement. Basically what we can see here is that uh, this, this hysteresis, which I was talking about before, occurs uh, as we increase the Reynolds number. But as we increase the Reynolds number more and more, we no longer just have this bifurcation associated with the transition between central and wall jet states. We also have instabilities associated with non-axisymmetric modes. Um, so these are neutral curves associated with m equals one and m equals two instabilities. Um, and again, we have this, uh, this is the central jet manifold. So this is where the solution looks, looks like a jet. And this is the wall jet manifold where the system is attached to the wall uh, shortly after being injected into the domain. Um, and so as the Reynolds number increases, um, basically we get uh, what you would expect, more uh, chances for instability, that, and this mainly occurs uh, for, the, um, for the central jet solution, not for the wall jet solution. The wall jet is inherently uh, more stable at higher Reynolds numbers than the central jet. Um, so now let's look at sort of the nonlinear dynamics that happen as we experience instability. So here I'm looking at two different cuts on this surface. So basically we can take this and we can slice it this way along a fixed Reynolds number or slice it this way along a fixed, uh, a fixed swirl number. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. Fixed Reynolds number or fixed swirl number. Um, and so here we're looking at a slice at a Reynolds number of 150 and seeing what happens if we change swirl. And the, the key point here is that uh, this m equals one oscillation appears, first of all, after the m equals two oscillation, which is consistent with literature but it appears, it bifurcates in a supercritical manner. Basically, as we encounter the bifurcation, we have a gradual increase in amplitude, um, which occurs sort of continuously um, as we increase the swirl parameter. Um, conversely, for the M equals two instability, we have uh, hysteresis. We have uh, subcritical behavior um, as the amplitude of that disturbance grows. And so that means that if we uh, considered a, uh, um, an oscillation and we decreased uh, the swirl, basically, we would see a different behavior than if we had a, uh, a low swirl and increased uh, the, the parameter. And this is true not just for the, the swirl number, but also for the Reynolds number. At this particular slice, it's not very extreme, this, uh, this subcritical behavior, but this persists at even higher uh, Reynolds and swirl numbers and becomes more and more subcritical as that happens. And I guess a key question which comes up uh, once you see this is uh, why? why? Why does one mode, uh, why is one mode supercritical? and one mode subcritical. And the answer to that is how these modes modify the mean flow as their amplitude increases. And so it turns out that the n equals one mode, uh, we can see from these visualizations of the, the unstable steady flow field and the time average mean flow field of the oscillation, we can see how basically what the, what the difference is, what that unsteady motion causes. Basically, the divergence of the Reynolds stress from that uh, instability um, changes the mean flow in some way. And for the m equals one mode, that's relatively small change. Um, basically, the flow looks, the mean flow looks very much like the steady flow, 
because this mode is not very efficient at mixing. It's not very efficient at changing how uh, a fluid exterior to the jet is entrained into the jet. Whereas for the M equals 2 mode, um, this, mo this, uh, this structure is much better at mixing. We can see that uh, shortly after the instability appears, um, basically the, the mixing which comes into this jet uh, causes the, the, um, the streamline, the separation streamline to go radially outwards. Basically this is much more efficient at entraining fluid and that means that um, this, uh, this mode is able to change the mean flow in such a way as to make it more unstable, basically to reinforce that instability and that, that drives this subcritical behavior. And just to compare this um, with uh, what was seen in, in some earlier experiments to show that I'm not talking nonsense, um, I'd just like to show a couple of animations which show th the these, these visualizations are from uh, Loiselu and Shomaz. Um, this is the M equals 2 and M equals 1 oscillation, which I talked about at the beginning of the talk. Oh, and are they going to play? don't want to play. Uh, okay, I can play them this way. So this is the M equals 1 oscillation, uh, which I just plot down here. Um, you can see that uh, this, this instability uh, vaguely resembles this one. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact animation I put right there. Um, but uh, this, this structure uh, rotates in the same direction with a similar frequency and uh, a similar structure as that uh, experimental one. And likewise, uh, the M equals 2 instability rotates in the opposite direction and has the same sort of S-shaped shape, uh, structure, which is very efficient at mixing fluid from outside the jet into the jet. All right. Sorry for that detour. Um, so that was all sort of in the pre-breakdown regime. I'm not going to get into this. I know this is a messy graph. I just wanted to say uh, that it gets really complicated once we start mixing this sort of pre, the shear layer dynamics with uh, this vortex breakdown uh, phenomenon. Um, and you can read the paper if you want, to, if you're curious, but the, the basic story here is that it's a mess and that much of these dynamics are subcritical. Um, but they all tend to be dominated by these singly or doubly periodic structures. Uh, they can rotate in different directions. And this explains uh, a lot of this mess. Wha basically, why, why do we see so many different things? Uh, it's because this system is extremely sensitive to initial conditions. We have a, a wide range of different periodic states which, ex uh, which pr uh, exist in the system. And so uh, it's not going to be repeatable. Um, it's going to be very sensitive to how you design your experiment. And you're going to see all sorts of different structures which range uh, greatly in appearance. Um, lastly, uh, right before I, I finish my talk, I'd just like to uh, talk about some extensions uh, we've done to this work. Um, beyond just sort of the, the basic uh, swirling, incompressible swirling jet, which I've shown so far. The first of that being a rotating Bunsen flame. Uh, so this is uh, basically the exact same system we talked about before, uh, just throw a flame in there. Uh, so we've got a flame which is stabilized at the outlet of that pipe. Um, in this case, I'm using adiabatic walls. Uh, this is some sort of preliminary work which I threw together for my thesis and which I'd like to do some more work on, um, but just for now we're going to deal with an adiabatic uh, wall condition. And so here basically we see that this, uh, this flame, uh, as we increase swirl from one uh, from zero down to four, we, are, uh, we see a very dramatic change in the topology of this flow, or of, of this flame. And that is driven by flow dynamics which are invisible uh, in experiments that were done in a corresponding system. Basically, um, it, without flow visualization, it would be very difficult to understand, or uh, there's no uh, clear reason uh, to understand why uh, this, this structure appears. It turns out that that is due to this emergence of a central recirculation zone, but not just that, also this transition to a wall jet. Basically, that's what causes the flow to uh, sort of produce this sort of mushroom type shape um, at higher swirl numbers. And importantly, we see the same type of hysteresis in the reacting case that we see in the uh, non-reacting case. Um, another uh, quick case which I'll look at is the case of an annular jet, uh, which is interesting because now instead of just having uh, the sort of uh, sort of straight jet, which is we increase swirl, increases entrainment until vortex breakdown occurs, uh, now we have uh, bluff body weight dynamics, which are coupled to that system. 
And so basically we can split this into three generally uh, general qualitative regimes, which include the wake regime, where as we go from zero swirl to a relatively low swirl number, we see an evolution of the wake from being uh, sort of a, a nice, uh, a large region, which exists right behind the bluff body, to one which is confined just to the lip, uh, interestingly. Um, and then as we uh, increase swirl even more, we get this breakdown regime where a central uh, recirculation bubble appears on the axis. And uh, what's interesting about this is that the intuitively, I expected that this, uh, this wake recirculation zone was going to somehow assist the formation of vortex, the vortex breakdown uh, recirculation bubble. But it turns out these occur sort of in separate, uh, separate structures which then merge rather than uh, sort of a continuation of that wake. And then lastly, um, as we go to higher and higher swirl numbers and through this uh, bistable region, uh, we get this uh, emergence of the wall jet state once again. Uh, and so, again, I won't go into great detail on this, but uh, just to talk quickly about the, um, the symmetry breaking and the dynamics which happen even without swirl in this case and why this, uh, the annular jet is so interesting. Um, let me just show uh, this, this diagram. Um, so what we've got here is a, a jet um, varying the diameter of the center body uh, relative to the diameter of the nozzle and the Reynolds number. In this case, the swirl number is exactly zero. And what we see here is that as we increase Reynolds number for certain uh, uh, center body diameters, we have a bifurcation where the system no longer maintains its axis symmetry. Um, basically, this, uh, this outer blue curve is associated with a symmetry breaking bifurcation where the flow basically goes from being a, uh, a two-dimensional axisymmetric flow to one like this, where it randomly picks a direction um, and maintains a planar symmetry, but not axisymmetry. And then subsequently experiences bifurcations to different uh, 3D periodic states, where it goes, where it either experiences a Kelvin Helmholtz-like um, planar symmetric oscillation, which can be either, uh, either slow or fast, or a very low frequency asymmetric oscillation, which is associated with streak-like structures, um, which, uh, which emerge uh, and sort of uh, extend far downstream. And uh, again, my videos uh, are not working. Um, let me quickly. So this is the, uh, the first of the um, This is the 3D planar symmetric, uh, basically uh, Bernard von Karman vortex street happening. The, the base flow here is actually uh, asymmetric. And so this, uh, this plane here is the plane of symmetry of this three-dimensional state. And then we also have uh, this plane asymmetric uh, visualization of the, uh, this ultra-low frequency asymmetric instability. Um, we can see how this uh, basically in what this would do is it will induce a slight rocking back and forth of the of the jet uh, from this. Will basically rotate the asymmetry plane slightly back and forth in a wobbling pattern. And so uh, with that, I'll just summarize and ask for any questions. Uh, so basically, um, I've used numerical bifurcation analysis to shed some insight in this transition between central jet states and wall jet states and swirling jets and highlight the role of the Cohen effect uh, as opposed to simply the vortex breakdown phenomenon. Um, and I've shown some uh, bifurcation analysis that was used to uh, understand why subcritical dynamics appear in swirling jets um, and also to see some of the physics which happen in more exotic uh, cases like uh, reacting jets and also um, angular jets. And uh, if you want more details on any of this, um, we've written a lot of uh, papers recently on this um, as well as my thesis. And with that, I will stop and uh, ask for any questions. It was a very, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a question about, um, uh, in the literature, you find the single spiral and double spiral vortex breakdown. So what is it? with respect to what you showed? So Mo most, mostly it's an unconfined or semi-confined environment. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, basically, once you get into the breakdown regime, it's 
either one of these things, and it's extremely sensitive to your initial conditions. Basically, there is not, in the vortex breakdown regime, there is not one periodic limit cycle state that exists um, that's sort of a global attractor. It's much more a uh, complex uh, web of different uh, sort of, I, I like to visual these as like complex tangle of different solution manifolds. And depending on your initial condition, you'll spiral towards one of those or maybe towards a quasi-periodic or chaotic oscillation involving several of those. Um, but basically, there's not a clear reason to expect uh, one globally over the others, at least uh, with the amount of analysis we've done. Um, this is Im important to note that this is all bifurcation analysis, so we're not looking at the evolution of initial conditions and pick, like defining the range of attraction. We're just saying uh, a steady uh, a, a periodic state exists um, and showing them all here. Uh, so it may be that these that many of these have very small basins of attraction and almost never appear. But uh, based on this analysis, there's no reason to expect one over the other, really. So we we have done uh, we haven't done it on the mean flow, but we've done it on the steady flow at the bifurcation point. Uh, and at, at the bifurcation point, you see a very hot spot of structural sensitivity concentrated right here, um, and you can basically see that the the Reynolds stresses from the M equals two oscillation are extremely concentrated where the structural sensitivity is high, whereas the M equals one oscillation much less so. So then, and also another question uh, is that uh, for these annular swirling jets, they're usually done for enhancing mixing in combustion or in a so sort of uh, multi-phase type of configuration. So you mentioned that you look at Poiseau flow inlet, yes. right? How uh, rel realistic it is to say that this is a laminar inflow for these type of configurations, or is it... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So for this case, uh, I would say it's... It may not translate exactly to a system, but it's perfectly valid. In this case, uh, we used stability analysis to verify that the, the steady state is of the laminar flow is stable. Um, however, we are considering very low Reynolds numbers compared to actual combustion systems. The one uh, asterisk I would throw on that is that if you think of these in terms of an eddy viscosity, uh, if you think of turbulence in that way, um, the Reynolds numbers, the effective Reynolds number may not be so enormously different um, as it as it appears to be just at first pass, um, and certainly we can see many of the same structures in very turbulent cases that we see uh, in this laminar case. Um, as I said, we were doing bifurcation analysis, and so low Reynolds numbers is necessity. We we cannot find a periodic state if there's a much bigger chaotic, you know, solution manifold. So we were kind of limited by that aspect. It would be interesting though to study the influence of uh, flow development. On uh, on these transitions. Yes, there have been there is some work in the literature that has done that. Uh, okay. Not not in the sort of a coupled base flow type uh, approach, but uh, separately, uh, basically taking an experimental flow field or taking a, a LES um, and doing stability analysis to explain some things. Oh, certainly, yeah. Yes, uh, not stable ones. Uh, we found uh, basically, if I go back, uh, if I consider drawing this bifurcation diagram, uh, which is at a Reynolds number of 100, at a Reynolds number of, say, 300, 500, something like that, uh, what you'll see basically is that you have a, a bubble which forms and then a smaller bubble which forms and there can be complicated interactions if you constrain the system to be axially symmetric. Once you release the axis symmetry constraint, basically you find that the dynamics, the asymmetric dynamics become so strong that uh, I really question the, the importance of that second bubble. Um,
Yeah, uh, so if I go back to the system, uh, we basically have a very large radius, uh, um, which looks like a sort of a hemisphere, uh, where we have this outflow condition, which stretches all the way to the wall. And we, uh, in the paper, we talk about a, a boundary condition that we developed, which basically balances the centrifugal pressure um, with from the swirl. Um, it's kind of difficult to describe without a slide that I, I, I didn't make a slide to specifically explain it, but uh, basically we validated that that was a, a good outflow condition for this uh, first swirling flow. Well, any more questions? No? Well, thank you, Chris, for this wonderful talk. Thank you.